Okay, it's for us a great pleasure, great honor to have Professor So Chen Sang here visiting us, giving this seminar for the uh, Instituto Nicolás Cabrera. Uh, Pro Professor Sang is uh, now at Stanford, he did most of his career in, in the States, but I think he, he, he likes us to say that he started his studies uh, in Europe, really, in the, his PhD he started in Berlin. Uh, no, my diploma in Berlin. My diploma yeah, in Berlin. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But, uh, so it's uh, very much connected to, to Europe, even if he's uh, uh, doing his career now in, in the States, and very much, much of the fundings uh, is connected to, to people, experimental groups here in, in Europe. Uh, so, Professor Sang is very well known in this, in this condensed matter physics community, but uh, for those who don't know him, just let me say that uh, in 2006, uh, he uh, predicted uh, with some colleagues the possibility to observe this topological insulating phases in this uh, uh, mercury telluride quantum wells. This was a theoretical prediction for well, the observation of this quantum sinkhole <laughs> effect. And this was, in fact, observed uh, one year later by the colleagues of Su Sheng in uh, uh, Wurzburg, by, uh, by Lawrence Mollenkamp. And there are also many other predictions he did in the connection to this topological insulator uh, phases, especially in this uh, 3D topological insulating phases. He predicted the possibility to observe uh, 3D topological insulators in systems like bismuth telluride and bismuth selenide. And this is now a very active field of research, even if it's a, res uh, a research which was motivated from theory. Now it's mainly a huge uh, experimental activity. There are many experiments all over the world trying to, uh, to demonstrate the predictions that uh, So Shen and others have uh, obtained. Uh, but for these discoveries, he had received many recognitions, uh, prizes. I'm not first one from Europe. First one, <laughs> the first one was from Europe. So he's very proud of being connected to Europe, and uh, that, they, that his work is connected to Europe. So I think it's uh, better that uh, So Sheng himself explains what's uh -huh. new, yeah. the new developments yeah. in this field. I think yeah. his talk is going to be uh, very pedagogical. Yeah. And he's actually asked uh, that everybody can interrupt or make questions. Let's do it in format. OK? So, Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Thank you uh, for the great hospitality here in uh, Madrid. And uh, oh, yeah. So I have been giving this uh, series of talks on topological insulator for quite some time. And after a little bit, it sounds like there's not really that much new and exciting. I get a little bit bored uh, by giving talks. But uh, just this year, uh, there's a very important discovery. So I, uh, usually my talk is called uh, uh, some kind of an overview of a topological insulator. Uh, but uh, now, this time, I have changed the title even, uh, called the complete. Uh, there's no point. Oh, okay. Yeah, the completion of the quantum core trio, and uh, again, I'm very happy to uh, uh, and yeah to to come to uh, Madrid. So the main idea is that <coughs> this is actually uh, a field in condensed matter physics or in physics that started more than 100 uh, years ago uh, with the observation of Mr. Hall of the Hall effect, and uh, now more than 100 years passed. Uh, we actually just only at this year have finally completed uh, the table of all possible uh, Hall effects. So uh, 19, uh, uh, 2013 
it's really uh, quite a historical year uh, in physics uh, with the completion of the uh, quantum hole uh, trio. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start very, from the very beginning. Uh, so the hole effect is so basic uh, that uh, we even can, I think in a lot of the high school textbooks, uh, that uh, you can even see that. And that's uh, basically a system, uh, condensed matter solid state system, uh, subjected to a, a external magnetic field. And when the charged particle uh, flows, in the presence of the external magnetic field, there's a Lorentz force. So if you pass a longitudinal current, you can measure a transverse voltage, uh, and that's, uh, that uh, transverse voltage comes about uh, because of the Lorentz force. And uh, you will measure a whole uh, resistance, which is the transverse voltage divided by the longitudinal current, and classically, uh, it is linear. Uh, that whole voltage is linearly proportional to the external magnetic field. So now, uh, actually, very soon after Hall, uh, maybe two years later, after he discovered the Hall effect, uh, he also discovered something which is called anonymous Hall effect. So you actually don't really need the external magnetic field. So he actually studied ferromagnetic materials. Uh, it can be ferromagnetic metal, and later people study ferromagnetic uh, uh, semiconductors. So in this case, there is a spontaneous ferromagnetism, means there's a spontaneous formation of magnetic moment uh, without any external magnetic field. So now here the fundamental physics, so of course we will say the magnetic moment generates a little magnetic field, but that effect is very, very small. So we know that the electrons couple to the external magnetic field in two different ways. Uh, one is uh, through, uh, maybe, in, maybe I can say three uh, different ways, uh, but one is through the orbital uh, magnetic field. In the Hamiltonian you have P minus Ea squared, and that couples to the orbital magnetic field that is here, and classically you get a, a Lorentz force, and quantum mechanically you form the Landau levels. Uh, but in other ways is that the electron can interact with the magnetic moment through Pauli exchange coupling, and the other uh, possible interaction is the spin-orbit coupling. So they are very, very different, uh, and if you have the spontaneous formation of the magnetic moment, there's exchange coupling to the itinerant electrons, and there's also spin-orbit coupling. So it's due to the last two couplings, the exchange coupling and the spin-orbit coupling, that give rise to the anonymous Hall effect. So in this case, uh, even though there's no external magnetic field, as you pass a current uh, in the longitudinal direction, you can also get a uh, whole voltage. So now fundamentally, from basic uh, fundamental physics, uh, the, the reason you can get a whole voltage uh, fundamentally is because of the breaking of time reversal uh, invariance. So usually in physics, uh, what is allowed by symmetry usually happens. So here the symmetry uh, happens because of the external, uh, because of the breaking of the time reversal symmetry through the spontaneous formation of the magnetic moment. So in principle you can get a whole voltage, uh, but uh, microscopically how that actually happens uh, is still a question of intensive uh, discussion. So now uh, we fast forward almost uh, one century. So these are all things uh, that uh, goes into every high school textbook and these almost all solid state textbooks uh, discusses uh, the anonymous uh, Hall effect. But so we fast forward to about the time frame of uh, 2003 and so even before that uh, there, are p uh, there is a group that predicted something called the extrinsic spin Hall effect and our group uh, predicted the intrinsic spin Hall effect. In this case there's a fundamental symmetry difference. Uh, this system, actually, there's no breaking of time reversal symmetry. No spontaneous formation of magnetic moments, no external field, so there's uh, no time reversal symmetry breaking. So in this case, by symmetry, if I uh, uh, pass a longitudinal current, by symmetry it's not allowed to develop a whole voltage. Uh, across in the transverse uh, direction. But what is allowed is that you can have an imbalance of the spin. So the current is flowing in this direction, you cannot accumulate charges, in the charge imbalance on the transverse sides of the sample, but you can, for example, have more uh, upspin here and more downspin there. So this is called a spin core effect. And uh, the uh, reference to intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, has something to do with whether that's uh, spin orbits scattering uh, against some uh, impurities or it's really a reflection of the intrinsic uh, band structure.
reaction. So this is uh, uh, this series I will call the classical uh, Hall effect, and they, of course, have all been experimentally observed. In this case, the uh, Hall. Uh, discovered both uh, Hall and anonymous Hall, uh, spin Hall effect was actually theoretically predicted. So now we fast forward to another, uh, the quantum version of these uh, uh, classical uh, Hall effects, and this is the great discovery of Klaus von Klitting uh, that uh, he um, observed a uh, quantum Hall effect that classically, uh, as you increase the external magnetic field, uh, classically, the Hall resistance should be linearly proportional to the external magnetic field. But what he observed instead is that this Hall resistance increases with the external magnetic field in precisely quantized plateaus. So these days, uh, these plateaus are quantized to better than one part in uh, 10 million or even better. Uh, so this already has become a standard of the resistance. So just on this trip to Europe, I started with celebrating the 70th birthday of uh, Klaus von Klitting, and so one important the thing I learned is that this uh, precision of the whole resistance is very soon going to be used as a definition of the kilogram that so you can balance the electric force with the gravitational force uh, as to use the precise quantization of the whole resistance uh, to define uh, what is a kilogram so this is a really a remarkable uh, precision okay so now after the discovery of quantum Hall effect there's many many uh, very important work on the uh, quantum Hall effect, but I would say that maybe we have started a new way of thinking, and that's uh, by starting, and that's the main subject of the talk uh, today, uh, by start thinking about the quantum spin Hall effect. So basically, you would say if uh, there's a quantum, so there are three classical Hall effect, if there's a quantum version of the classical Hall effect, uh, it's a very natural question whether there are quantum versions of these uh, other two classical Hall effects. So here, uh, so actually the fundamental explanation of the quantum Hall effect is basically in the presence of an uh, uh, external quantizing magnetic field, uh, basically the inside this sample, uh, the electron form closed cyclotron orbits, but on the boundary of the sample, they form some kind of a skipping orbit. So you develop this kind of edge state. And the edge states are all going around in one direction for both upspin and downspin. And uh, this uh, phenomena uh, basically is uh, also, uh, you can uh, roughly identify uh, the uh, plateau quantization to the number of edge channels you have in this uh, system. So the parallel to the quantum Hall effect is then the quantum spin Hall effect, in which case you reverse uh, the, the circulation direction of the one of the spin direction. So in this picture, for example, the downspin is going around in a clockwise fashion, and the upspin is going around in a counterclockwise fashion. So you see these two type of motion are exactly time reversal invariant of each other, and, uh, and it's insulating here in the bulk. So we were very fortunate to be uh, uh, to predict the very first uh, topological insulator in nature, namely in the um, uh, system of mercury uh, terrorite, and then uh, they actually can change the thickness of the mercury terrorite. So the, that system, depending on the thickness, can either be a trivial insulator, in which case when you tune the gate voltage, you get into a regime when there's almost no conductance. So this is the regime when uh, everywhere is insulating, both uh, in the boundary, in the interior, and on the edge. But when you then change the thickness uh, to be a little bit thicker, to be beyond 6.5 nanometer in thickness, then you get this uh, beautiful edge state picture, and uh, you can actually see that in uh, quantum transport as a quantization in the conductance uh, to be two, and this two exactly measures the number of edge channel here. So then, uh, so this uh, moves the history to from 206 to 207, our theory in 206 and uh, experiment uh, in Würzburg in 207. And then the most natural question is, what about the quantum anonymous Hall effect? So we were again predicting theoretically in a series of works starting in 2006, but uh, with a very good proposal published in the Science Magazine in uh, 2010 uh, of a quantum anonymous Hall effect in magnetic topological insulator. So in this case, you have magnetism in topological insulator. So well, you can achieve something like that, 
by putting magnetic moments into standard topological insulator, such as putting manganese into mercury terrorite or putting chromium into bismuth terrorite. So in this case, in the case of chromium uh, into bismuth terrorite, the system becomes magnetic even in the bulk insulating state. And then uh, any magnetic material ha will have a hysteresis loop, and you can measure the whole resistance uh, as a function of this uh, hysteresis loop. And you find that even as zero external magnetic field, the whole conductance of the system is quantized to be something like 26 kilo ohm, which is the indication that the system went into this novel state called the quantum anonymous whole state. So this is a kind of so. So this uh, we're living uh, again uh, to 2013. I think will be remembered in the history books of Hanas metaphysics as the year finally the quantum hall trio has been completed and uh, my story today will be mostly focused on these two uh, systems. So, uh, so we first uh, got uh, interested in this system uh, first uh, quite theoretically together with uh, uh, another group by Charlie Kane but uh, we all thought about some material which were unrealistic. So then uh, we actually started thinking and looking at this diagram, which is actually very famous uh, for all semiconductor uh, engineers. This is uh, plotting binary semiconductors in the space of uh, energy gap and lattice constant. So energy gap is usually very important because, uh, for example, we were just discussing this morning, uh, if you want to uh, make a good solar cell, you know where solar spectrum is peaked, and you can just look at, uh, uh, you should pick materials out of this, uh, along this horizontal line, for example, can in terrorite uh, is very good. So this is the energy gap which can be converted into wavelengths. So the lattice constant is also very important because the engineers uh, semiconductor uh, physicists or engineers like to uh, put them on top of each other to form heterojunctions <coughs> to do clever band structure engineering and then you can tell which materials can be put on top of what. So we actually one day were looking at this uh, diagram uh, and uh, we suddenly actually noticed uh, that this is a very interesting way of plotting that all the energy gaps of these uh, binary semiconductors are all positive. So most people don't even think that there's a sign associated with the energy gap. They always thought the, only the absolute ma uh, value matters. <coughs> now it turns out for bulk property, indeed, only the absolute value of the energy gap matters. But uh, actually the sign uh, for the topological behavior, it matters a lot. So the mercury terrorite out of this entire uh, space of binary semiconductor, there's one strange material called mercury terrorite, which has a negative energy gap. And that uh, is what caught our attention. And uh, we were able to predict that uh, this mercury terrorite is a, a topological insulator. So here in Madrid, we have uh, groups both uh, doing quite a uh, quite few theory-inspired considerations, more material-inspired consideration, and so on. This is actually a story uh, where kind of uh, I had a background in field theory, and I know that if you and that's what I'm going to tell a little bit more later, that if you have Dirac equation with the mass changing sign, it changes the topology. So that's some few theoretical results which inspired a direct prediction of materials. It's a really pretty good story. And ever since then, uh, we follow this design rule that if you have bending version driven by spin orbit coupling, that's the key critical ingredient for topological insulated behavior. And ever since then, almost all topological insulator has been predicted theoretically before the experimental observation. And a large part of the prediction was made by my uh, group at Stanford. So now let me tell you briefly uh, about the physics of this uh, material. So it's, uh, uh, of course, we always try to understand physics by a simple, uh, basically realistic, but you don't need to uh, worry about too many details uh, uh, for the, at the beginning. So if you have this uh, semiconductor system, usually the relevant orbitals are the s orbitals and the p orbitals. So you look at s orbital, it can be spin up, spin down. You look at p orbital, and in this material, because of the strong spin orbit coupling, you only take the uh, all p orbitals which are stronger spin orbit coupled. So if you have spin up, you take px plus ipy, and if you have spin down, you take px minus ipy. So your most uh, important 
states closest to the Fermi level, you only need to consider the S states and uh, what is in semiconductor physics is called heavy hole states, uh, which are strongest spin orbit couple. So now you write down a kind of a simple tie binding or hopping model. So this is a 4x4 four four matrix. The Hamiltonian is a 4x4 four four matrix uh, expressed in the basis of these uh, four orbitals. And so you have the upper diagonal 2x2 two two block, which describes the spin up component for the S orbital and P orbital, and then the spin down component, which is the time reversed of that. So here, the time reversal symmetry actually plays a very important role. So now, when you look at the Hamiltonian in the up spin block, which is 2x2, two two, and then you try to figure out what is the relevant term. So first of all, along the diagonal, uh, the k equals to 0 component uh, will be expressing the energy difference between the s and the p orbital. So this is when the interesting physics of mercury territe comes in. In mercury territe, because of the strong spin orbit coupling and because of another relati relativistic effect called the Darwin term, uh, the s orbital lies below the p orbital. But in the another material, can in terrorite, uh, the p orbital lies above s orbital. So that's the uh, that's when you look at the, these uh, plots. Uh, this is what means whether the gap is positive. So they have taken the convention is that if the s orbital lies above p orbital, the gap by convention is positive, and uh, mercury terrorite has another behavior where by convention it would be negative. So this thing you can actually change the diagonal element, you can change continuously by sandwiching mercury terrorite between cadmium terrorite. And by changing, slowly varying the thickness of mercury terrorite, you can actually change the relative position between the s orbital and p orbital. So this turns out to be very, very interesting. So now when you look at the off diagonal matrix element, that uh, talks about the overlap between s orbital and the p orbital. So now s orbital and p orbital have the opposite parity. So therefore, at the k equals to zero gamma point, they cannot couple because uh, then, uh, then it will, if they couple with a constant term, it will violate uh, parity uh, conservation. So then by parity, they cannot couple, and, but they can then couple to the linear order when you tailor expand out. And then the quadratic term here will be describing something like the band dispersion of S band with itself and P band with itself. So in the close to the gamma point, k equals to zero, you can tailor expand this tight binding model. So you have the constant term, which is like the mass term between S and P, and uh, you have the off diagonal term, which are linear, and you can also expand to the quadratic term. So this is a very simple uh, model description of the mercury terrorite layer. So the important thing you to realize is that because of the coupling between the S and P orbital, uh, this model actually has the linear term. And that reflects that this is describing a relativistic Dirac equation in two plus one dimension. Uh, because we're talking about a two-dimensional uh, quantum well structure, the space component, you can uh, just look at the, the two, component, uh, two space component and one time component. So now, uh, by now, you are not so surprised to, to see uh, the rock equation emerging in condensed matter uh, system, like graphene is a famous example. But there's some key differences here. In graphene, it is described by also by a Dirac equation in two plus one dimension, but the mass term is identically, almost identically zero in the case of graphene, and that's why a lot of people got interested uh, in graphene. But uh, here uh, we have the wonderful opportunity that the mass term is continuously tunable both in magnitude and in sign. Uh, when you look at the mercury terrorite layer, so the, there's a level crossing between S and P when the thickness is about 6.5 nanometer in thickness. So the mass can change from positive to negative simply by changing the width of the quantum well. And then uh, this becomes very interesting. Okay? So then there's two regimes. One is the mass and the quadratic dispersion have the same sign. In the other case, they have the opposite sign. And that turns out to be the key uh, ingredient for topological insulator behavior. So now let's do some very simple uh, thing. Uh, you take this two-dimensional system and you periodically identify the x direction and leaving open boundary condition along the y direction. So then kx is a good quantum number and let's say for now let's just pick kx equals to zero. So then you try to solve this Dirac equation along the y direction and in the inverted mass regime you can always basically think of uh, outside the vacuum to be positive mass. So then uh, the sample boundary 
look like a domain wall for the Dirac equation. So actually, if you play with the Dirac equation, you find that if there's a domain wall, it traps some bound states at the domain wall. And so you trap one bound state for the upspin, uh, because we have a 4x4 four four, uh, matrix, so you have one bound state for the upspin, and then another bound state for the downspin. So the picture you get is that uh, both for positive and negative mass, there's always a gap in the spectrum. You have the conduction band, you have the valence band, but then you have for one side, on one side of the, of the edge, you get these trapped two mid-gap states inside the energy gap. And that's for one given kx. So now as you change kx, the energy of these uh, levels will start to change. And that is, sweeps out a one-dimensional dispersion relation. So now these states, uh, we gave a name, it's called a helical edge state. So previously, uh, the, there was an the idea of chiral edge states. In the quantum Hall effect, there's only one branch uh, that goes only in one direction. So chiral somehow means handedness, and uh, that uh, is the physics of the quantum Hall effect. But here, there's no breaking of time reversal symmetry. You have both counterpropagating direction. You have goes one going around and the other going counterclockwise. And these two dispersion intersect at one point. And this is a very, very special point. The point at kx equals to zero, uh, the time reversal symmetry is preserved for both of these states. Uh, momentum k breaks time reversal. So if at k equals to zero, uh, there's a fundamental theorem in quantum mechanics called the Kramer's theorem. It tells you that in a time reversal invariant case, energy levels have to form a doublet. So this point forms a doublet. And then when k is, kx is not equal to zero, they sweep out the dispersion. So that tells you something very, very important. It tells you that as long as you respect time reversal symmetry, uh, the system actually <coughs> cannot have an avoided level crossing. So these two levels have to cross each other as long as there's time reversal symmetry. So in other words, to say that these helical edge states are uh, topologically protected. So another way to view this is in a semi-classical uh, sense, that if you look at this helical state, you will ask yourself what happens if you have a non-magnetic impurity. So here, the important consideration is time reversal symmetry. So if you have a non-magnetic impurity here, uh, you wonder, because you have two counter-propagating states, whether they can be backscattered. The, the red states hitting an impurity can be backscattered into the blue state. So now you play using K, you can. So if you have a state uh, propagating along one side of the edge, it hits a non-magnetic impurity, and that impurity in principle can scatter it back. But now you realize that only the upspin is propagating forward and the downspin is propagating backward. So in order to turn this edge state around, you also have to turn the spin around from up to down. So then, uh, if you have a non-magnetic impurity here, as Feynman has instructed us, you, uh, you have to sum over all possibilities. But if you have time reversal symmetry, there's always two possibilities you have to sum over. One is going around the impurity in a clockwise fashion, and the other is going around the impurity in a counterclockwise fashion. Okay, So now when you go around in a clockwise fashion, you see the spin, in order to scatter it back, the spin has to adiabatically rotate as well, from up to down, and in this case the spin follows the orbital, and it goes around in a clockwise fashion. So let's say by convention it rotates the spin by an angle of pi, clockwise from up to down. But then there's also the possibility to be backscattered from the imp non-magnetic impurity in a counterclockwise fashion. So in this case, the spin also have to rotate, but in this case, in a counterclockwise fashion from up to down, and we define by convention to be minus pi. So almost everything is identical between the blue and the uh, green path in the language of Feynman, but then there's a difference between, in this case, the spin rotates by pi, in this case, the spin rotates by minus pi. So the difference is pi minus minus pi, which is 2 pi. So this is this is some very, very fundamental thing in quantum mechanics we have learned, is that if you have a half integer spin, for example, the electron carrying spin one half is such a case, and in, if you rotate a half integer spin by 2 pi, the wave function acquires a minus sign. So that tells you that these two possible ways of backscattering always have a relative minus sign difference between the two. Okay? So this beautiful argument will tell you that they will always interfere with each other destructively. 
there's always a minus sign, and this minus sign is very fundamental. It comes from the fact that spin one half particle rotating by two pi will give you a minus sign. So that tells you uh, that's another argument to say that the edge data protected from backscattering. But actually, deep down, it is, uh, this, was a, uh, this is a semi-classical picture, maybe easier to understand. This is a full quantum mechanical explanation in terms of the Kramer's theorem. But deep down, the reason you have Kramer's theorem in quantum mechanics is also because when you rotate spin by 2 pi, it gives you minus sign. So fundamentally, they are really the same. So this uh, immediately tells you that there's something deeply profound about this topological consideration. This fundamental nature of spin one half particle protecting this uh, edge state. So you remember that uh, we, this is the most difficult part when you, we teach quantum mechanics. I remember when I was a student, uh, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle already looked pretty strange. Pauli principle looked pretty strange. But then when you learn that so you rotate something by 2 pi, you get a minus sign, it was absolutely mind-boggling. But it's really the beauty of quantum mechanics tells you it's such a strange uh, principle can lead to direct microscopic experimental consequence, and that's what we're predicting here. That uh, it leads, it's this fact. But then we, we try to explain that to the students. We say, well, why it's not, maybe not so strange after all? Imagine if you have a Mobius strip and you imagine yourself being an ant, you uh, crawl along the Mobius strip, but when you come back, going around in full circle, you do not come back to where you started, but you come back to the opposite side. So you see, this kind of argument uh, smells very topological, and that's roughly where topology comes in. That's the best I can do uh, by making it uh, very intuitive. So then uh, we got, so obviously this was uh, maybe the exi most exciting moment in my life when we realized all this. Uh, and we quickly wrote a paper submitted to Science in 2006. I remember it was in August of 2006. And uh, quite remarkably, uh, it was accepted within one month. But even during this one month, we sent a preprint to, to Würzburg. And the reason, uh, because uh, early on you know a little bit uh, about the history, we predicted something called, uh, I was working on high density superconductivity uh, early on, but then suddenly I got very interested in spin orbit uh, couple system, I predicted the spin Hall effect. And that time in solid state physics there was a big deal called spintronics. So I got invited to all these spintronics con conferences. And Lawrence Mollenkamp from Würzburg was also invited to a lot of these conferences. And then we started talking, I got to know him, and I learned there's only one group in the whole universe uh, that, uh, that makes a very good mercury terrorite quantum well, and that's in Würzburg, uh, uh, Germany. And uh, so then, uh, yeah, it's also a very nice story about uh, European way of doing science. Uh, this uh, group was uh, able to work on mercury terrorite for 20 years with continuous support uh, uh, during these 20, now they are of course very, very famous, but during these 20 years, they didn't produce uh, something really, really flashy, but the support uh, was uh, very uh, continuous. So it, it's a very good story about this European way of doing things it still has <laughs> a lot of advantage. So anyhow, uh, so we, uh, I got to know them very well, and uh, they, they, <laughs> uh, they thought that this is really, really exciting. So uh, we sent them the preprint. They immediately start working, but they are already experts. They know exactly how to control the thickness of mercury tail right layer. They know how to apply the gate voltage. And almost all the experimental techniques was known to them. So then they grow this layer to be less first as a control experiment, uh, something like a layer thickness of 5 nanometer. In, uh, so this is also a story of nano engineering to perfection. It's uh, very, very important for the science here because we predict that when the mercury territe layer is less than 6 nanometer thick, it is an ordinary insulator with no edge states in between. But when the thickness is beyond 6.5 nanometer, it becomes a topological insulator. So the gap was finite here, finite here, in between it collapsed, but when it reopened, it grabbed in this edge state uh, into the band gap, uh, which are localized on the edge. So experimentally, they first uh, tuned the gate voltage from conduction band to valence band. Uh, in the middle of the gap, they see the conductance is nearly zero. Okay, and then they made this uh, uh, structure, and then they find that the conducting is two uh, in between, and the two is independent of the width 
uh, of the sample uh, and uh, independent of the details. And the explanation here is that so you have this edge state picture, which I already explained. It comes from the so the B and H is uh, my students at the time, Andrew Bernovic and Taylor Hughes, uh, and uh, this was our model. Uh, which some people now call BHC model. Uh, and then, uh, so this really comes out of the solution of our model. So now if you uh, contact, if you have a bias uh, with uh, left uh, side chemical potential, right hand side chemical potential, if you raise the chemical potential on the left hand side with respect to the right hand side, you see that uh, on the upper uh, edge, the red is sourced from the left. And on the lower edge, the blue is sourced from the left. So if you raise the chemical potential on the left uh, electrode, you populate the red channel more on the upper edge, and you populate the blue channel more on the lower edge. So altogether, you have two axis channels. So that, by Landau Beautical formula, predicts a conductance of two two axis channels. But it also tells you that there's a quantum spin hole effect here. Because if you raise the chemical potential here, uh, in the current flowing state, uh, you have more the red channel, which is <coughs> spin up and more the blue channel here, which is spin down. So indeed, you have a transverse spin uh, imbalance, uh, which was later observed also in modern times uh, lab. So now I hear that there's a, uh, uh, also exchange with Stanford uh, between Madrid and uh, Stanford, which I didn't know before. But uh, I, uh, since then, my colleagues at Stanford uh, was able to uh, receive many samples from Würzburg and my Stanford colleagues are experts in having real space imaging. So this is the ideal experiment to do. So you say, oh, this x ray picture is nice, the transport uh, data is nice, but can I really see uh, directly in a real space imaging? And Ken Moller's group uh, saw it. And uh, the way you see it is that you tune the gate voltage from the metallic regime to the insulating regime. And the prediction is that in the insula nominally insulating regime, you will still have edge uh, currents. So uh, focus on the blue cross. Uh, this is the magnetic field distribution as you measure by uh, scanning a squid loop uh, across the sample. So you get a magnetic field distribution, <coughs> and so we know the Beers of our law, so we know immediately how the, uh, you can back out the uh, current distribution along the x direction from the magnetic field uh, data, and you see the current is indeed quite spread out in the sample. And now when you go to the yellow star region, that's the nominal uh, gap region, and you see this is the magnetic field distribution, and you back out the current distribution, you see indeed it's more focused on the upper edge. So here you're feeding uh, with the electrodes uh, here. So you, that really shows in the real space imaging. So now the exchange group at Stanford also uh, invented a very nice probe called the microwave, uh, scanning microwave tip. So they can scan across the system uh, uh, in this uh, quantum well structure, and you can also tune the gate voltage. And the microwave is very sensitive, uh, whether you have metal or insulator. Even a microwave oven can tell the difference. Uh, but uh, if you have a tiny tip, you can detect which region is metallic and which region is insulating. So when they're at zero volts in the nominal gap region, they see uh, uh, the black region means no conductance is very low. The white region meaning, meaning the conductance is very high. So that you can you see the conductance is mostly on the edge. But when you're at 200 volts, you see the conductance is all pretty much white. And that uh, means uh, you have uh, in the <coughs> you have bulk carriers, and here you only have edge state carriers. Mm -hmm. So everything is very very consistent with this uh, picture. So now let uh, me come to uh, some new materials. Uh, so this morning I was very happy to see uh, extensive effort here on quantum well uh, structures, and so we actually in 2008. So when you remember this chart. Mercury territe is the only material that is, has an intrinsic bending version. But all these other materials don't have a bending version. But we predict, predicted a new idea in 2008, and that idea may go pretty far. Uh, that even if you have in the arsenide, which is non-topological, and gallium antimonide, which is non-topological, when you put them together, you can actually get a topological insulator out of it. And the reason is uh, as follows. As you put these uh, two materials together, the 
bottom of the conduction band of indium arsenide sinks below the top of the valence band of gallium antimonide. So even though each material by themselves is not topological, the combination uh, has a relative bending version. So these, uh, you have these two intersecting parabola, and so the hopping at the boundary actually opens up a gap. So this system, even though you have these two intersecting parabola, it is still a uh, uh, it is still an insulator, but we predict because of this relative bending version, it is a uh, it is a uh, point and spin hole system. So this was the prediction made in 2008, and I think we can now generalize this mechanism to many other uh, material. And so now Ray-Ray Du's group in uh, Rice University have seen, uh, observed our prediction. So they made different uh, device structure, and so you can predict from uh, uh, Kiliko HD picture what is the quantized conductance, and it works uh, perfectly. So this is, uh, they have been working on that ever since our preprint, so five years from 2008 to today and uh, finally uh, there was a preprint just a few months ago uh, one month ago uh, about this beautiful result. Uh, here you tune the gate voltage and you indeed see the quantized conductors. So this could be a very interesting system uh, here there are uh, experts on excitons. This system I think also has excitons but no one has even theoretically considered uh, so that's something maybe we can start thinking about uh, with the theory group here, uh, what is the interplay between the exciton physics and the uh, topological insulator edge state physics here. So now the life goes on, we have to predict new materials. So the, the advantage is that these materials, uh, mercury territe in the arsenide, uh, you can see this beautiful uh, transport uh, uh, experiment, but you notice the temperatures are pretty low. Right? And the temperature is low because the gap is very small. So this gap is about uh, 7 million electron volt uh, here. In mercury terrorite, it's about 10 million electron volt here. So the question is whether you can predict some material which has a very large energy gap, much higher than room temperature, so then you can, you can maybe even uh, apply, make it applied. Okay? So now, uh, we actually just uh, less than a month ago predicted the, at that time, we still don't know the proper uh, English word or proper Latin word. What is the so a carbon honeycomb lattice single sheet is called graphene. At that time, we didn't know what how, what to call two-dimensional tin uh, lattice. But uh, on the trip of Europe, I met my more my more cultured uh, friends. And uh, tin, the chemical symbol is SN, and that comes from the Latin word of stannum. And if you make a honeycomb lattice of uh, stannin, uh, it will, should be called stannin. Maybe this is the first time <laughs> the word is coined. So yeah, anyhow, if you make a two-dimensional honeycomb lattice exactly like graphene, but using tin atom instead of carbon atom, uh, we have computed theoretically that it also forms a stable honeycomb lattice. But here, instead of uh, having uh, uh, graphene, it's basically a very smooth uh, layer. Here, there's a buckling of the tin. So the honeycomb lattice is a bipartite lattice. You can color the atoms by two colors, and one of the color buckles out of the z-plane, and the other sinks below the z-plane. That's the side view of it. Okay. So now you can just like graphene has a graphene version that you can terminate uh, the uh, the carbon atoms uh, above and below by hydrogen. That's called graphene with A instead of E. So there's also a version of that uh, for uh, stannine that you can put uh, hydrogen termination above <coughs> and below. Uh, that actually turns out to be non-topological. But instead of hydrogen, you can put uh, fluorine, chlorine, berylene, ir iridium, and so on. And it turns out that all these are topological as according to our first principle calculation. And uh, furthermore, uh, they have a gap of 300 million electron volts. So oh, I hope the flagship project in Europe can be broader than graphing itself. <laughs> Anything that uh, maybe has a name uh, can be uh, part of the flagship uh, project. So this could be an interesting new frontier, merging graphene research with uh, topological insulator research. So anyhow, this could be a very interesting, but it, it's a very challenging experimentally. So it takes a lot of money, a lot of conviction to do this kind of experiment. So this is our first uh, principle calculation with uh, stunning with uh, fluorine. Flor Fluoro uh, will have a gap of uh, zero point, beautiful direct 
Ban Gap. And so we'll have a uh, beautiful helical edge state uh, uh, and that may be uh, observable at room temperature because the gap is 300 milli electron volt and room temperature is 30 milli electron volt. So now, uh, as Alfredo mentioned, we were also fortunate to be able to predict a three-dimensional topological insulator. And that's how discoveries in science are made. But once you know that mercury terrorite is a topological insulator, you have a rough idea where to look for in the periodic table. right? So you should look for uh, topological insulator in the lower right corner of the periodic table. And furthermore, you look for heavy elements uh, which have very large spin orbit coupling leading effectively to a banding version. So mercury terrorite is here, and you can see that uh, bismuth terrorite, bismuth selenite are here, uh, tin is here, and uh, so there's quite a lot of combination you can do. So the popular material today for topological insulator is bismuth selenite. Uh, they form this quintuple layered uh, structure with the center of inversion here in the middle, and uh, you can uh, you can also uh, so that's uh, also quite similar to graphene physics. Uh, you're having a layered structure. So you recall in the case of mercury terrorite, the relevant band inversion is between the s orbital and the p orbital, but here uh, it's only the p orbital. But uh, because there's a center of inversion layer, there's two different kind of p orbital: the bonding and anti bonding. So if you look at the uh, p orbital, you first <coughs> have the quintuple layer, you form the bonding and anti bonding p orbitals, mm -hmm. and then uh, you look at the crystal field uh, splitting because it's anisotropic. Uh, z axis is different from x and y. And it turns out that pz bonding and pz anti bonding orbitals are the relevant thing close to the Fermi level. And when you turn on spin orbit coupling, there's a bending version. So the mechanism is similar to mercury terrorite. But uh, nature is very interesting. Not only has she given us uh, this uh, set of material, but uh, you recall in the case of mercury terrorite, we could continuously tune uh, the effective strength of spin orbit coupling uh, by tuning the thickness. But now if you have three-dimensional material, there's no thickness to tune. But uh, nature gave us four materials, and out of the uh, four material, one of them does not have enough spin orbit <laughs> coupling, so that's a trivial insulator. But uh, these three uh, have strong enough spin orbit coupling, and in this paper we predicted that these three are topological insulator, but with a single Dirac cone on the surface. So that's really beautiful physics. You have an upper co uh, a conduction band, lower valence band, and you have a crossing uh, at this uh, middle point, uh, which is at a gamma point. So this is a beautiful Dirac cone physics. And so we also proposed the uh, uh, effective model. Uh, I was very happy to learn yesterday the theoreticians here uh, are also, also like this model and they have done some very nice work uh, uh, on this model. And that uh, you have this off-diagonal matrix element exactly because you have this uh, bonding and anti-bonding p orbital, so the coupling matrix element has to be linear. And on the diagonal, you have the mass term, and that tells you about the level difference between the PZ plus and PZ minus, and there's a bending version for three of the material. So once the bending version occurs, now you have a three-dimensional material with a two-dimensional surface, and so we solve the uh, structure for that, and that's analytically solvable from this uh, Hamiltonian, and you get a uh, surface Dirac cone, which is located at a gamma point, uh, and it's furthermore spin uh, polarized. So the difference between the topological surface state and graphene is that uh, the topological surface state is one quarter of graphene. Uh, Andre Geim likes to remind me that graphene is four times topological insulator. <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, the reason this is a one uh, quarter is that uh, that uh, uh, there are two valleys in graphene and two spin. But on the topological insulator surface, uh, it's always at the, the gamma point. So there's no valley degeneracy and there's no spin degeneracy. For one given uh, point in momentum, there's only one unique spin direction. On the upper Dirac cone, it forms a left-handed uh, uh, helical structure. On the lower Dirac cone, it forms a right-handed helical structure. So one very interesting thing about this uh, uh, field of topological insulator is that it's like a universe reflected on your tabletop. When you look at the spectrum of elementary particles, neutrino exactly has this property. Uh, neutrino in nature is left-handed, but only anti-neutrino in nature is right-handed. 
there's no right-handed neutrino and there's no left-handed anti-neutrino. And that's exactly the same kind of physics here. The upper Dirac cone is left-handed and a lower Dirac cone, like the anti-neutrino, is right-handed. So maybe we can speculate further on that towards the very end of the talk. So now let me move to the anonymous Hall effect. The anonymous Hall effect has a very long history, and this uh, is a recent review article on the anonymous Hall effect by the leaders uh, of the field, both the theoreticians and experimentalists. And there are a lot of discussion about intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, mechanism in anonymous Hall effect and so on and so forth. So I think a clean way to answer this question is to go to the extreme limit and to go to the quantum limit of the anonymous Hall effect. So early on, uh, Hodain, Duncan Hodain proposed a model on a honeycomb lattice, uh, basically the graphene lattice, uh, but with a model with circ microscopic circulating currents. So from this model, this toy model, he could see that without the external magnetic field, but with this microscopic circulating current, he can generate quantum half without an external magnetic field. But so far, there's no experimental realization of this toy model, but it was important for conceptual development. So we actually picked up the subject starting in 2006, and we introduced a model of the quantum anonymous Hall effect. Uh, by that I mean, all model, in contrast to Duncan's model, uh, contains spin orbit coupling and magnetization, which are the key ingredients of the anonymous Hall effect. So now if you look at the simplest possible model, I can reason that way, that if you have a Hamiltonian, if you consider spin degree of freedom, it has to be at least a 2 by 2 model. Right? You can have spin up and spin down. And uh, if you have a 2 by 2 model, uh, then the Hamiltonian can always be, because the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian, it's always expandable in the basis of the Pauli matrix. Okay? So then, because there are three Pauli matrices, there are three coefficients in front of the Pauli matrix, and the identity term is never very important. So this is a model without any quantizing external magnetic fields. So if you study the whole effect of the system, you actually arrive at a beautiful formula uh, expressed the whole conductance. If you have an insulator, namely a conduction band, the valence band, then all the Pauli uh, Fermi factors drop out, and so you actually find that the whole conductance of the system, of this model, a very simple, simplest possible model, two by two. This is another interesting thing I like to make a side remark. It's very hard to teach pedagogically, I find, quantum Hall effect because you have lambda levels, localization, very complicated. But quantum anonymous Hall effect, which is discovered 20 some uh, years later after the whole effect, it's very, very simple to explain pedagogically. And you only need to consider a two by two matrix model. Okay? So then, if you just do a simple perturbation theory for this two by two model, you find the whole conductance is given by this topological invariant. So this D is nothing but the coefficients in front of the Pauli matrix, and so this is a three dimensional vector. You have three components, you have three Pauli matrices, so you have three Ds. If you normalize its length, so the D is a vector of unit norm, or D hat is a vector of unit norm. So what you're essentially describing is that the type binding model is defined on a two-dimensional Brion zone. So you have Kx, Ky, but periodically identified. So the topology of the two-dimensional Brion zone is a torus. Okay? But then the d vector is a three-dimensional vector, or the d hat vector is a three-dimensional vector normalized to unit norm. So that describes the sphere. Okay, so this d hat vector is describing nothing but the mapping from a two-dimensional Brillouin zone torus to the surface of the two-dimensional sphere, and that mapping is classified by a topological winding number, and that winding number is nothing but the whole conductance. Okay, so if that winding number is equals to z most of the time, uh, so if you have a two-dimensional insulator which breaks time reversal symmetry, the whole conductance by general principle has to be strictly quantized. Most of the time it is zero. But if this winding number is non-zero, it actually is, uh, it gives you a quantum anonymous Hall effect. Okay? So we have identified the key physical ingredient. Uh, and now you can see why you need uh, both spin orbit coupling and magnetization. So in order to get this quantity to be non-zero, you see basically you need all three components of D. 
if one of the components is identically zero, the cross product will immediately give you zero. Okay? So then it tells you, when you look at the poly matrix, the Z component is describing the magnetization, and the XY component is describing the spin orbit coupling. So it immediately tells you that you need both spin orbit coupling and magnetization, and uh, you, you, you can understand that this is the uh, important ingredient. So another way of uh, understanding why topological, magnetic topological insulator can have uh, quantum anonymous hole is from this picture. So we say that the topological insulator surface has a Dirac cone. But when you put on um, magnetization, uh, you break time reversal symmetry. So the Kramer's theorem is no longer valid, and you open up a gap. Uh, and uh, that gap has been seen experimentally, by the way. So, but now you may wonder what happens when the magnetization would have a domain wall, right? Because magnetization that always, you know, when the sample is big enough, will have a domain wall. So you have this three-dimensional material, you have a two-dimensional surface, and then on the top, uh, on the surface, you have this magnetization, and the magnetization now changes from up to down, and this region will have a uh, uh, magnetic domain wall. So we predicted in this paper that on that magnetic domain wall, and that was the picture taken out of our paper, that lives a chiral edge state. And the direction of the chirality is given by the cross product between the surface normal, so if you have a three-dimensional insulator, it has a surface normal, uh, cross product with the gradient of the magnetization. So here the surface normal is Z direction, the gradient is along the X direction, and the cross product gives you the Y direction. But it picks only one direction, not both directions. So this is the chirality uh, of the surface. So this immediately tells you that if you have magnetic topological insulator, you can get realized quantum anonymous Hall effect. So then we did a lot more work uh, to work out the real materials. And we first predicted uh, out of this picture that if you put manganese into mercury terrorite, I was very happy to learn that here there's a lot of work on manganese doped into cadmium terrorite. But anyhow, when you dope it to mercury terrorite, originally you have T uh, symmetry, time reversal symmetry, but uh, magnetic moment due to manganese will break time reversal symmetry. And you can basically annihilate one pair and leaving only another pair intact. So you go from quantum spin Hall effect to quantum anonymous Hall effect. And then we predicted that if you put, uh, put 3D, uh, uh, meaning 3D orbital uh, transition met metal elements into uh, standard uh, topological insulators such as bismuth terrorite, you can form magnetic order. And with uh, my colleagues in China uh, at the Institute of Physics, uh, we predicted that this system uh, will form magnetic order in an insulating state. That's actually highly, highly non trivial. That, that there are not that many magnetic insulators in nature, but we predict that they would be, and furthermore, uh, it, it will develop a quantum anonymous Hall effect in this system. So the mechanism, uh, the mechanism for magnetic order, we propose two, uh, one into nine, one into uh, 2010. So, uh, so being a theorist, it's always good to hedge your bets a little bit that uh, <laughs> if you put uh, both uh, mechanisms. Uh, so, uh, so we have the surface uh, which forms the Dirac cone when you preserve time reversal symmetry. But when you put in magnetic moments, then you break time reversal symmetry and, and the gap can open up. So, but then the magnetic moments can talk to each other through the surface Dirac state. But usually you know about this so-called RKKY interaction. If you put magnetic moments into a metal, usually you have a, a oscillatory magnetic coupling. But the oscillation frequency or wavelength comes from the Fermi wave vector of the metal uh, or, or of the dope semiconductor. But now, if you have surface Dirac uh, home, uh, at the Dirac point, there's no KF. There's no momentum KF. So we actually predicted in this paper that the surface uh, coupling is always ferromagnetic and has no oscillation. The oscillation only comes when you put the Fermi levels above or below the Dirac levels. So that's one mechanism to get ferromagnetic ordering. And another mechanism, so that's more uh, intuitive. Another mechanism is that when you have uh, 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 ordinary insulator, it has a band gap, 
but after you have a banning version, you open up a gap, and then you have more, you have a ring of minimal gap, uh, indirect gap, and that gives you more phase space to create virtual magnetic excitations. So we actually predict that in this material, even in the insulating state, has larger magnetic accessibility than ordinary insulator. And that larger enhanced magnetic accessibility, even in the insulated state, is enough to mediate enough magnetic coupling in the magnetic topological insulate. So this was the theoretical prediction all the way up to 2010. And so the exciting moments comes from March of this year. So I have been uh, in the past few years uh, going back to China and there's a very, very good group uh, by the Tsinghua University. So I just want to show you the main players. Chi uh, Kun Shui is the group leader uh, and he has uh, a very big group, uh, almost infinite amount of funding, a lot of uh, uh, MBE machines, uh, uh, STM integrated with the MBE machine, APAS uh, integrated with the MBE machine and so on. So they can carefully grow the sample and study in situ as the sample grows layer by layer what is the property of this uh, system. And uh, these are the two young physicists who contributed uh, a lot, Ya Yi Wang, who got his PhD from Princeton, and He Ke, and this is the colleague Fang Zhong, with whom I worked on first principle calculations. So the experimental signature is that as you vary the chemical potential in this magnetic topological insulator, for the longitudinal resistance, you should see that it goes to zero and the whole conductance should go to this plateau quantized value if you vary the chemical potential. But if you vary the magnetic field, you will see that you have the hysteresis loop associated with the magnetism, but you will see that at zero magnetic field, you get uh, E squared over H, the whole conductance. And this is the beautiful data obtained uh, from this uh, experimental collaboration uh, that uh, at low enough temperature, you see in the whole resistance, you have the hysteresis loop and it's quantized to be very close to one in units of H over E squared. At the same time, uh, the longitudinal resistance uh, here is getting closer and closer to zero, but at the transition, when the, uh, at, this is called a cohesivity field, when the magnetization is switching direction from up to down, uh, the longitudinal resistance has a peak. Uh, I will offer some theoretical explanation for that. So at the same time, when you change, fix at the H equals to zero, change the gate voltage, you actually see that as you tune the gate voltage, you get to a whole resistance equals to one, but the longitudinal resistance having a sharp dip. And that sharp dip is the sign, or well, that, <coughs> so this picture you use, in the case of quantum warfare, you get by magnetic field sweep. Here you're sweeping the gate voltage. So the analogy is uh, remarkable. So that's the difference between quantum anonymous hole and uh, quantum hole. You get one e squared over h, but uh, the resistance longitudinal is not fully going to zero as it should be, and I will give some theoretical explanation why this is the case. So now we got very excited, uh, another theoretical prediction coming true, and so we tried to go for the next thing. Uh, how do you find quantum anonymous hole? So far, uh, quantum hole effect has easily reached many plateaus as you change the external magnetic field. But here in quantum anonymous hole effect, how do you reach the higher plateau? That's the question. So basically the idea is that if you look at our picture of 208, you have the top and the bottom surface state, and they can hybridize, and they can also open up a gap due to the magnetization. And it's this surface state after hybridization which is giving rise to the quantum anonymous hole effect. But uh, if you uh, look in the, so we were also discussing uh, yesterday, that if you have a thin slab, of this material, basically you have surface states, but it's fundamentally not that different from the subband states that you can get uh, for a thin slab. So if you look at other subbands uh, and their interaction with the magnetic moments, to make a long story short, you can get higher plateaus of the quantum anonymous hole. So basically we worked out the phase diagram. This is the thickness of the uh, slab and uh, then you can also vary the exchange constant. And you vary the exchange constant by varying something like the chromium content 
that you put into the system. So this is the phase diagram that we obtain. And notice a very, very remarkable thing, that if you are at some fixed, so a large part of the phase diagram indeed has trend number equals to 1, that's the thing that's observed experimentally. But we predict that if you fix some uh, thickness and go up by putting more chromium, so that increases the magnetization, you can go to higher conductance plateaus. So there is a fundamental difference how you reach higher plateau between quantum Hall effect and quantum anonymous Hall effect. In the case of quantum Hall effect, when you go to higher magnetic, external magnetic field, you go to lower conductance plateau because higher magnetic field increases the degeneracy of the lambda level and basically decreases the filling factor. So you go to lower uh, conductance plateau. But here, we predict that in the case of quantum anonymous Hall effect, when you increase the magnetization, you go to higher conductance plateau. So even though you find uh, magnetization and the magnetic field may be similar, I point out to you here there's a fundamental difference. Higher magnetization gives you higher conductance plateau for quantum anomalous hall, and, uh, and uh, higher magnetic field in the case of quantum hall effect with lambda level bring you to lower conductance plateaus. So this is some first principle calculations. So we're now very, very detailed. I find that in collaborating with experiment, you have to give them uh, idealized designs. Only then they're willing to try it out. So we played a lot with the design of the sample. Uh, this is the combination, best combination we come up. And uh, we predict a 12 quintuple layer of that system. With this value of exchange field, you can reach the second plateau. So now this will be important later on, why you want to reach higher plateaus for techno possible technological applications uh, of these materials, which I will come back to later. So, but now let me, uh, so how I'm doing in time. Um, I should, uh, getting close to finishing, right? So, so but uh, I think I would rather explain the pedagogy slowly, but uh, other things you can, <laughs> uh, I go by very quickly. So the, basically the explanation why there are, the, uh, the resistance is not completely going to zero is because of the coexistence of the chiral and the helical edge state. So you can read this uh, preprint that we just posted. And that uh, explains the data pretty well. Uh, and then you can, uh, oh, so then I just use this as a final slide. So uh, you can go uh, from, so now uh, uh, I would say a very, very important milestone has been reached in the topological insulator. So for pure topological insulator without heat breaking, uh, we already discovered the two-dimensional topological insulator in mercury tenrite, and by putting magnetic elements into it, you can annihilate one pair of the helical edge state to become chiral edge state. So then you go from uh, quantum spin hole to quantum anonymous hole. And quantum anonymous hole, it looks like you already have a minimal degree of freedom at the edge. You only have one channel, and so this channel is uh, purely uh, chiral. It only goes in one direction. It looks like it's the smallest thing you can get. But then you, when you think about it, you can actually put particles above the Fermi level, or you can take out a particle below the Fermi level to create a hole. So even though it's a chiral uh, channel, you can have particle type which is distinct from the hole type. But then when you put this system in proximity with a superconductor, you can annihilate even one of those. And then you get pure chiral Majorana fermion. So the proposal is that if you put this quantum anonymous hall system in proximity effect with the superconductor, the quantum anonymous hall can be viewed, even though it's one chiral channel, you can view this as two chiral Majorana channels. And then when you put that in proximity effect with the superconductor, you can annihilate one of the chiral Majorana channels. And that is the holy grail that everybody is looking for. And we are going to Erichi next week to discuss what will be the best proposal, what's the most striking experimental signature. But at least we have one proposal in the game, and that's put, uh, now that quantum anonymous Hall effect has been discovered experimentally, to push one step further to look for its proximity effect with a superconductor, and for which we predict that this reaches the chiral topological superconductor. So now let me come to the end. So uh, topological insulator is very exciting because it connects to all these different branches of condensed matter physics. 
it's maybe even more exciting because it's like a baby universe uh, in which you can see uh, monopoles, axions, and myelin fermions. And maybe the most provocative question you can ask is whether the universe is a topological insulator and we're living on some boundary of a four-dimensional universe. Actually, you, you may be laughing, but uh, uh, like early on into uh, one of the reasons, the first time I came to Spain was in Bilbao, and there's a European project <laughs> called Universe in a Lab, and it's all talking about these kind of uh, ideas. But also has uh, possible technological applications. Uh, the, uh, the semiconductor chip has been developing according to Moore's law, but uh, Moore's law is also doubling the number of uh, uh, the amount of heat every 18 months. And the reason it's uh, creating this tremendous heat dissipation is because inside the semiconductor chips, electrons are like Ferraris moving in a crowded marketplace. They keep bumping into each other. And the ideal thing is to build an autobahn. Uh, inside semiconductor chips. But when you look at how the autobahn works, it's exactly the quantum Hall effect. You have opposite uh, moving traffic spatially separated. So the idea is to build an autobahn system into the semiconductor, which is realized by quantum anonymous Hall. Of course, for that, we need a larger gap. We, we already got rid of the external field, and now the only thing we need is a larger gap. So you may, be, you may think this is just a talk I gave in order to, to grant uh, agencies to give a glorious picture of how fundamental physics can be used for application. But in semiconductor industry, there's a standard body which uh, publishes a, a publication which is like the Bible that guides the semiconductor industry. That's called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. If uh, something is on their roadmap, it means it eventually will be done, most cases. And topological insulator as a way for interconnect, which is our proposal for which DAPA is funding it, the semiconductor companies are funding it, is already in the 2011 roadmap of uh, semiconductors. So the way they work is that if you want to get the 2013 roadmap, you have to pay a lot of money. But uh, two uh, the reports that two years old, it's free, available on the internet. That's, uh, so it's already a topological insulator uh, building the autobahn as an interconnect. It's already in the roadmap. So with that, I conclude. Uh, this is an exciting field. A uh, lot of, lot of uh, very good theoretical idea. But I hope to convey w uh, with you the idea that experiments are still moving forward in a very rapid pace. Uh, things like uh, quantum anonymous Hall effect has just been discovered. Things like uh, uh, in the arsenic and antimonite uh, is a very standard semiconductor material. It's already a topological insulator. And uh, maybe with here we can do a lot of collaboration, thinking about excitons in, uh, in, uh, in the arsenic and antimonite, many other theoretical ideas, like the nanowire idea you have with, uh, uh, with <coughs> Uh, with a cylindrical geometry, I need to email you that experimental paper. It looks like a very good uh, switch. And there's one experimental paper which uh, observes a very good device performance. So very rare we have a field which is uh, still relatively young. As Alfredo observed, a lot of the key contributors are quite young. And it's very fundamental. One side connects to uh, things that we see which are quite similar to what we observe in the world of uh, standard model of elementary particles. Uh, on the other hand, it goes all the way across uh, to possible applications uh, going into your chip. And uh, with that, I conclude. Okay, so I think uh, we went a bit out of schedule, but uh, I think everybody would agree that listening to you is, uh, uh, well, you learn a lot, uh, you're very, very pedagogical, so, but uh, let's see if we have time for some questions. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, what's the power law of decay of the quantum anomalous small connectivity with gate voltage? Oh, oh, uh, that I didn't pay that much attention. Uh, as a function of gate voltage. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, of course, the prediction is that these should be in the same universality class with all quantum core transitions. And uh, we, uh, we actually predict that uh, the best model to describe it is a random Dirac mass model. 
So that's something I skipped over quite uh, quickly. Yeah. So from that, uh, but uh, the critical behavior should be universal. It should, should be with a power of seven thirds or something. Yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, very, very good question. Not with real space imaging yet, but with transport, uh, there is. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you the detail. It's with a split gate with the English capital letter H. Uh, they, with that, they could tell the spin. Yeah. yeah. Is there any chance to observe the frequency dependence of sigma xy in transfer spin? Very, very good question. In quantum anonymous form? Yes, yeah. Yeah, in principle, yes. But this group it doesn't do that much optics. So, but they're right now already giving samples. They, Stanford already has uh, the, their sample to image the real space uh, current distribution in quantum anonymous form. So, I, I yeah. have yes. Herman. So, so, your single thin layer. Mm. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Yeah, uh, we know ting is superconducting. Uh, well, you know, a theoretical prediction of superconductivity doesn't have such a good track record. So, uh, so I will let the experimentalists first uh, build this layer uh, and then try to see. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Yeah. I have one question. Everything you presented here is essentially non-interactive. Yeah, yeah. So, so I can give another hour of talk. <laughs> so we actually have a very a nice uh, criteria to determine how whether interacting topological insulator is or is so, not. Okay. Yeah, but that uh, is yeah. But so far, there's no material. Uh, well, uh, quantum anonymous hole requires interaction because uh, the formation of a magnetic moment <coughs> is an interaction effect. In, in, for, for but it's not uh, correl strong correlation. Interaction is important, but I wouldn't say strong correlation. Strong correlation. Yeah. It, because, for instance, in this uh, ma magnetic uh, doped yeah, 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 yeah. wouldn't you reach a regime where a condo effect? Like yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, like this, uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, maybe. And uh, we also discussed yesterday about oxides. Uh, there are quite a few theoretical proposals for re uh, reaching oxides to be topological. So, no lack of theoretical proposal, but uh, we need to find one model material, like uh, mercury terrorite, where we can really understand everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, yeah, actually, uh, if you look at my concluding slides, this is on the list of uh, important <coughs> future direction. So, uh, improve material properties, strongly correlated topological use. Oh, yeah, this is an old slide. This we can cross. <laughs> it has been discovered. Uh. But I'm really fascinated by this uh, stunning proposal. If uh, graphene has been discovered already, right? So if the flagship want to do something in the frontier of science, this could be... Uh, <laughs> let's uh, do some lobby for that. Pablo, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's actually is uh, proposed to be a uh, theoretically proposed to be a condo topological insulator. Uh, there are quite a number of experiments, but I say I would say the experiment so far is not yet conclusive because the gap is very small, very hard to do spectroscopy. What is the state of the art of putting magnets on top of the breakout? Mm. Very good. There are quite several groups uh, who are trying, but none have reached the quantized limit. So, again, we have proposed both <laughs> the magnetic uh, magnets on top of topological insulator and into the topological insulator. Looks like the into version at least won the race for quantum anonymous hall. Uh, so there's a very uh, good group in uh, <coughs> in MIT uh, near MIT, the Lincoln Lab. They put the European sofa on um, topological insulator. They have some very good results, but not quantized. Okay, so 
I think uh, already late. Thank uh, Sosheng again. Uh -huh.